Hello everyone and welcome to another retro fanfiction episode. The retro series is where we take old fanfictions from my other channel, Lewis Films, and we re-upload them to this channel for new viewers and maybe older viewers who haven't seen these in a while to enjoy once again. If you are new on the channel, make sure to subscribe for more fanfictions and hopefully you enjoy the video. Here is Retro The Amazing Spider-Man 2 Rewrite. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 Lewis Films Edition. Okay, so first of all, no. The entire first 10 minutes of this movie, no. Peter should not have this suit. As much as I like the Tasm 2 suit, because trust me, it's the best live action suit by a long shot, keep the Tasm 1 suit. Tonally, this makes no sense. This is the beginning of the problems when it comes to the tonality of this film. The suit is the star and it gets much worse. The suit should be the Tasm 1 suit because that is the vibe this series is going with. This series in Tasm 1 set the dark tone and I'm not saying it can't be light hearted, it's just that it started out as a dark tone and then skips straight to a light tone with the second one, at least have a fade. I like the Batman vibe this Spider-Man universe gives off and it should stay that way, at least for this film. Tasm 1 took risks by doing it different and I'm not gonna lie, it worked. Like, it actually worked and I praised Tasm 1 for doing this and you guys know I love that movie. But then Sony decided to listen to the 30% of people that didn't like that and changed it to the colourful rainbows and a suit that looked like it came straight out of Hollywood. This doesn't make any sense. First off, I know the suit looks good, but it doesn't look like Peter Parker made it. The suit from the first movie, I can get Peter making. But the Tasm 2 suit, no fucking way. People don't like the Tasm 1 suit, but should you? I mean, it's a costume made by a teenager in his basement. So should it look good? No, it shouldn't. And damn, it doesn't look that bad. So this movie, he will keep the same suit, except it will have a few tweaks and adjustments just so they can sell more action figures because, you know, we're semi-realistic over here. So straight away, we're going to replace the suit and stay consistent with the tone from the first movie. The first scene can still be in the daytime because that doesn't really matter. I get that every scene in Tasm 1 with Spider-Man were never in daytime, but it's unrealistic to think he wouldn't be out in the day, so keep it. It doesn't matter. Have him stop a few low-key crimes, though. Don't have him chase the rhino, okay? Have Spider-Man stop crimes, crack his jokes, and swing away. Don't have him accidentally kill people by having been cocky towards the rhino. This is not Spider-Man. I don't know how much I should utterate this. Utterate? That's not a word, is it? Jesus Christ. Second thing about this first opening scene, we're going to cut Rhino completely from this movie. He doesn't need to show up. He just doesn't. Hashtag leave Alexi alone in the comments, please. Now let's move on to New York City. New York are going to be aware of Spider-Man, but the majority either don't care or don't really know what to think of him. The George Stacy movement from the first movie is still going to affect New York here, and New York will become more of a character in itself, really homing in on Spider-Man as a character and allowing Spider-Man to grow in a world that feels whole around him. It is the worst thing to see a film when a world around a character is just bland and boring and has no detail. Luckily, Tasm 2 didn't do a horrible job of this, it's just that it didn't have any significance, so we're going to give New York its own arc in this movie and from not trusting Spider-Man to absolutely adoring him. So the events from here on out are going to play the same. Peter is late to graduation because of Spider-Man and we get reintroduced to Aunt May, etc. But here's the difference. Him and Gwen won't be dating and we won't have any of this confusing bullshit back and forth drama between these two characters. They're simply going to be friends and it's going to be awkward. Yes, before you point out that Peter completely regressed at the end of the last movie, well, that's getting rewritten too. No, he didn't. Not anymore. In a scene after the graduation, it is revealed that Peter and Gwen had a conversation about their relationship and that they want to stay friends but shouldn't date. Peter tells Gwen honestly that it was because of her dad and he doesn't want to break that promise to Gwen's father. Doing this, we can also remove the ghost Dennis Leary. That was a pointless thing to do and it was creepy and weird. I get the whole thing of Peter having PTSD or something like that, but it isn't mentioned anywhere else in this series that Peter suffers from mental health, so this whole PTSD George Stacy stuff does not make any any sense. So we're going to cut that too. So let's introduce the main villain, Max Dillon. That rhymed. Now this character in the original Tasm 2 was fucking dreadful. He didn't even have a solid motive. It was like he was there for plot convenience rather than being an actual character. Originally, he was picked on by everyone from his boss to his co-workers and basically had no friends whatsoever. So the person he looked up to was Spider-Man. Okay, that's a good start, but then the reason he turns evil is because he wants to be famous, but then when Spider-Man, the literal hero of the city, gets the attention he is mad. 
and now he hates Spider-Man. Bitch, what were you expecting? So instead, let's change him around. We're going to go the complete and opposite direction and the opposite end of the spectrum and Max is going to hate Spider-Man. He's going to be one of the people that doesn't like him at all. This way we can get an interesting delve into Max's character and the representation of the city of New York through this character at the same time, which adds world building as well. But at the end of the day, Max doesn't care and he just wants to get on with his normal life. He still works at Oscorp and doesn't have many friends. Heck, you can still have people pick on him or be mean to him, but I won't be so direct about it. I'd rather have him be disincluded in a staff meeting or a conversation or something like that. Max is also going to have a wife that wants to divorce him. She isn't going to be seen on screen, but we can have a letter or something that Max reads that talks about it. This can add further depth to his character, and G just wants to live a peaceful life with no troubles, although things may not work out, which could be a foreshadow for what's about to happen. Okay, Max is set up, then we've got to introduce Harry Osborn. Now we're still pushing it by introducing characters this far into the movie, but this time hopefully it'll work. We still get the whole thing with Harry dying and Norman Osborn dying in that one scene, but instead, this time Harry has a lot less time to live than Norman did. This can make his desperation for a cure be all the more believable because in the original movie, he had enough time to live until he was about Norman's age, which, let's be real, was a long ass time. So it's revealed that Harry is dying quicker than Norman ever did. It is also revealed that Harry was a disappointment to Norman. This triggers Harry to try and accomplish something that his father never could, thus setting up a goal for Harry. The Oscorp CEO position now lands in Harry's hands as Norman is dead. Donald Menken and the other people on the board will have a distaste for Harry, but the difference in my version is that they won't fire him yet. It'll be a slow progression into insanity instead of being rushed into one movie. I'll give Tasm two praise though, I really do like Harry and the direction they were going in, but due to the overcrowded nature of the film, he felt rushed and underutilized. So Harry will stay the head of Oscorp for the rest of the film. Also, side note, Harry will not become the Green Goblin. Electro is enough for this film. We do not need the Green Goblin too. Instead, we're going to develop Harry's character and save him for a future film. We then get a scene with Harry and Peter again, just like the actual movie. I didn't mind this scene though, to be honest. I thought it was quite fun and I liked seeing these two characters interact and reconnect. Throughout the rest of the movie, Peter and Harry will grow to become best friends again, like they almost did in the original, but sort of didn't because, like I said, Harry was underutilized. We can also have them discuss Gwen again, and maybe you could throw in that scene where Harry meets Gwen, but like, make it less awkward, please. Harry is working hard on his work, trying to prove his father wrong while also working hard on curing himself or finding ways to do it. He doesn't tell anyone that he is dying though out of his own privacy and this could represent the trust between Harry and Peter and their friendship. The point where Harry tells Peter about his disease could be the point at which these two characters finally become best buds again. Anyway, in this scene, we could have Harry be testing things to the limit and him accidentally blowing something up. Harry sends Max, the technician, to fix it and he gets shocked and this is where he can turn into Electro. However, Harry will be an asshole to Max ever since he made his return, putting tension between these two characters. I've decided we're going to take Max in a more spectacular Spider-Man direction. So we're going to have Max just want to live a normal life again and be normal, but at the same time, his hatred towards Harry Osborn grows. This way, we stick with the bully aspect of the original movie, but also his motive makes much more sense now. He doesn't like Harry Osborn because he was an asshole to him, and all he wants to do is just live a normal life. He'll be in the hospital, and he pleads to get out of there. When the doctors refuse, he breaks out in his anger. He will walk down the street normally, yet when trying to do day-to-day -day things like normal, he is hindered by being conductive. This drives him insane until he snaps and he wants revenge. Max goes after the one person he can blame the most, which is, of course, Harry Osborn. Whilst this is happening, Peter and Gwen decide to meet up because they've decided they don't want things to be awkward with one another and they want to resolve this whole friendship thing that they've got going on, which they discussed earlier as well. They want to be friends, but not awkward. They both realize that they want each other in each other's lives, but can't actually have each other. So this will be as similar to the scene we had in the original movie with Electro showing up, but this time it isn't for them to settle their breakup, it's to define their friendship. Max explodes and goes after Oscorp Tower where Harry is. Max, now Electro, wipes out a floor of the Oscorp Tower looking for Harry. Peter's spider sense goes off and he goes off looking for him, leaving Gwen. Gwen is left with an unsure look though. You can tell that Gwen really wants to get back with Peter, but as an audience, we already know Peter would want to do the same, but they're also being hindered. This is going to add a little bit more depth to Gwen's character and just build it up and build the tension up between these two characters as well. 
Spider-Man arrives on the scene to stop Electro. Electro doesn't want anything to do with Spider-Man and keeps telling him to get out of his way. Spider-Man cracks jokes at Electro, calling him Sparky, etc. This pisses Electro off even more. Spider-Man saves Harry, Donald Menk, and Felicia Hardy and a few others from the tower. He then has his first full battle with Electro. Spider-Man beats Electro and Electro zaps away into hiding, but not without a casualty. One of the Oscorp workers died in the fight. This crushes Peter, even though Spider-Man saved everyone other than one person. The next day, J. Jonah Jameson of the Daily Bugle rips into Spider-Man, focusing on the fact that he didn't save that one innocent life and that he could have avoided the fight with Electro Oscorp, not that he saved everyone else. This further reflects the city throughout the middle of this movie, and the reputation is on the decline with Spider-Man. Harry will have a scene where he's looking through the destruction of Oscorp. Menken is on his tail, however, and mentions to Harry that this is not acceptable, and if Electro's creation is linked back to Oscorp, they could be in big trouble. This is the first hint of Menken wanting to take control of the company from Harry, and it's his first major turn in Harry's frustration that will be consistently building over this movie. Harry's resilience, however, disregards Menken, further elevating his cocky nature to do something with Oscorp and turn it into a legacy. Yet, the thought of himself dying is still clear in his mind. Once Menken leaves, Harry comes across some files about Richard Parker's research into spiders. He thought this would be a good idea and tried to find the spiders to help cure himself. When inquiring to find out, it is revealed to Harry that all the spiders were destroyed just before he became the CEO. Remember this fact, by the way, guys but also no one knows why. Just remember this for future videos, by the way. Come The Amazing Spider-Man 3, just remember this bit. Harry only has one more option, and that's to ask for Spider-Man's blood, just like in the original movie. This is the point in the story where Harry will ask Peter if he can ask Spider-Man to meet him for his blood. Harry does this since he finds out that Peter takes pictures of Spider-Man on occasion for the Daily Bugle. Peter says that he'll find him. This is also the scene where the trust between these two characters becomes very evident and they become pretty much best friends again. We then get a similar scene to what we got in the movie where Spider-Man visits Harry. As much as Peter would like to help his best friend, he knows he can't. He is put between a rock and a hard place. He knows he can't. Spider-Man's blood could kill Harry, plus Peter doesn't want his genetics getting out there. This is a risk, especially with Oscorp on the radar, that he can't take. Harry now hates Spider-Man, and he also puts out a statement about his distaste in Spider-Man, further fueling the city's resentment over the wall crawler. Peter is at the lowest of lows in this movie at this point. He can't help his dying best friend, him and Gwen can't be together, the city hates Spider-Man, he just doesn't know what to do. Peter is trying his hardest to find a way to cure Harry, and this leads him to be coming down. Aunt May and Gwen will be there for moral support, furthering the relationship Peter has with these two characters. Peter goes looking for answers for Harry's cure, and this is where we get the underground tunnel scene from the original movie. Except this time, the difference is, Richard Parker didn't inject his blood into the spiders. This allows Spider-Man to be anyone and doesn't make Peter Parker special in any way. He doesn't find any answers to Harry's cure, just some more information about the spiders and why Richard did what he did, thus continuing the Richard Parker story set up in the first movie. Also, before leading into the third act, we'll have a scene with Max Dillon reflecting on himself and what he has become, the monster that Osborne had turned him into. Plus, everyone is against him, including society and including Spider-Man. Spider-Man, not willing to understand him, has further cemented his hatred towards him. There will also be a scene on the down low where Peter is out as Spider-Man and you can clearly see the city doesn't like him. Peter is highly considering hanging up the costume as it affects his social life with Gwen and also everyone hates him and also Harry Osborn as well. Then in an alleyway there is a kid getting bullied for wearing a Spider-Man mask and cosplaying as him. Spider-Man drops down and decides to help the kid out. This is similar to the kid that got saved in the actual movie. However, this scene now represents New York's view on Spider-Man, but also there are still people that have hope in Spider-Man. The kid's name is Miles, just for reference, why not? Peter decides that the people need a Spider-Man to believe in, someone they can look up to and not someone they can resent. I'm going to be taking a page from my Ultimate Spider-Man video here, so just beware. So Peter will reveal another costume he's been working on, which is the actual TASM 2 costume. However, it won't be as professional and it won't look as good as it did in the actual movie, it'll look a little less glamorous. Thus now having a smooth transition from a darker tonality to a slightly lighter one, which was what the original movie was going for. This does not mean I will change the complete vibe of the movie for the last act, yet this costume represents a new hope for the city and a new chapter in the life of Spider-Man. 
Just a little side note here too, Gwen will not actually get the offer from Oxford in this movie like she did in the original one and she won't die either. This movie was already stuffed as it is, plus in this time it can actually be used to build on her character even more and her relationship towards Peter. But it isn't all flowers and roses as Electro is back and he's out for revenge and he's got nothing to lose which makes him dangerous. He's out to kill everyone that ever wronged him, as he has been driven completely insane. Electro goes to the power plant to level the entire city, as he believes at this point everyone is against him. So basically he's just going to commit mass genocide. However, Spider-Man swings in to save the day. The beauty of this interaction is that Spider-Man's arc and Electro's arc throughout this movie are completely the same, yet they went in the completely opposite directions. Everyone was against both of them. Electro felt like everyone was against him, including the city, and the entire city, including his best friend, were against Spider-Man. Yet Spider-Man decided to turn a new page and never give up, and Electro gave in to the resentment and wanted revenge. This final battle in this movie represents two speeding trains that look and act the exact same, heading for one another in a collision course. The city will be under threat from Electro and the police can't do anything about it. The city's last hope is Spider-Man and they have to put all faith in him to stop Electro. Spider-Man comes swinging in and for the first time since the end of the first movie, the city are glad to see their local hero come to save the day. Spider-Man fights Electro and brings him in. Spider-Man eventually saves the day but Spider-Man also gets heavily injured in the process. Then just at the end of the movie, we'll get a semi-sad scene of Gwen visiting Peter crying. She can't handle Peter getting beaten like this and her not always being there for him. Gwen makes the executive decision that they should be together and convinces Peter to go against her father's words and that she will be fine. Peter agrees, but is it a mistake? This is a conflict that will haunt them in the future movies to come. But at this point in time, Peter is actually the happiest he's ever been in a very long time. This movie does not end on a sad note and will actually end on a final swing. Similar to the first movie that ended on a final swing as well. This one will be powerful, uplifting and the theme will blast as Spider-Man swings through the city and then the credits roll. The post credit scene is the gentleman in the shadows again. It isn't revealed who he is just yet, but... He visits Electro just like he did Duck Connors in the last movie and Harry in the original movie. Thanks for watching the Retro Tasm 2 video. If you did enjoy, make sure to like on it and also stay tuned because next Monday we will be posting Retro The Amazing Spider Man 3. So stay tuned for that. Spectacular Spider Man coming on Sunday and also another fan fiction coming this Thursday too. With that being said, thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Take care and peace.